Before we get started, a few special thanks. First of all, I'd like to appreciate our track partner for, for Anything Goes, Boston Open Impact. I think some of the members of the Boston Open Impact are on this presentation today. So thank you again for your support and support of Break Time. And um, also I'd like to take a moment to recognize and appreciate Break Time. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, Break Time and our whole 2021 social innovator cohort have worked to strengthen their capacity to connect and uplift their communities in a time of great need. And Break Time is deeply committed to their work and has made strides on the policy front of the state, local, and federal government to allocate funding to youth employment. Uh, we're for their hard work and we're very excited for you all to hear more about them later today. And finally, I'd like to appreciate the SIF team for all of their hard work and preparing for today's event, which is the first one of the year. So we're excited and be a little bit rusty. Um, and obviously super grateful to our speakers, Christine Abrams, Connor Tron, Kayla Woodbury, and Michael Apricio for joining us today. And we'll look forward to hearing from you very, very soon. So before we get started with why we're here today, I'm just gonna share just a little bit about the Social Innovation Forum for those of you who might be new to our work. I think we're gonna share uh, a couple of slides for that. Our mission at the Social Innovation Forum is to create positive social change in Greater Boston by engaging leaders, strengthening organizations, and building networks. Um, on one side of our model graphic, which you will see very shortly, on the green side of our model graphic, um, You'll see that we do this work by engaging and informing funders and investors about social issues and also about the most promising solutions to these social issues, helping to create avenues for directing resources most effectively for real impact. And on the purple side, we also provide support to leaders of nonprofit organizations, such as break time, to build capacity so that they can deliver their most effective solutions to the social issues in the area. And we intentionally make connections and build relationships across diverse communities so that people on both sides of that equation can help each other to generate significant social change. We like to think of our work as taking a marketplace approach to social change where SIF is creating the marketplace and inviting people in with all sort of skills, resources, connections, expertise, and needs and helping them to make connections, to leverage their strengths and to learn from one another. And being here today, all of you are part of this marketplace. So we hope that you'll learn from our experts here today. You'll consider finding ways to support our nonprofit leaders. We're on the ground tackling some really important social issues. So now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Christine Abrams, who is the president and CEO of Commonwealth Corporation. Christine is a fierce visionary leader with more than 30 years of progressive financial and organizational leadership experience with Fortune 100 companies, startups, and nonprofit organizations. Christine has a breadth of experience leading companies like Americas and Australia, for instance, services at IGT, Signature Bread, and General Mills, where she was named a woman of influence in the consumer foods industry. Christine was also elected by her peers as the chair of the Northeast Network of Executive Women. So please join me in welcoming Christine. Thank you so much. And I am uh, extraordinarily delighted to be here today. Uh, what an important time for us all and what an important topic uh, for us to be discussing today. So I look forward to the conversation. Next slide, please. Um, Commonwealth Corporation is in the skills building business. We have had, um, this past year has been one of um, thoughtful contemplation and uh, building our overall strategy. I came into Comcor two weeks into the pandemic, wonderful timing, um, but it did provide us with an opportunity as the ball was firmly in the UI court for us to really think about what this pandemic and all that it exposed meant for the corporation. And we have, I'm thrilled to say, a new mission, 
vision, which really reflects um, our um, focus on equity um, and uh, as well as um, a very collaborative approach to how we work and solve problems with you all. So our new vision is Commonwealth Corporation fosters workforce equity in Massachusetts by delivering innovative and collaborative professional development solutions that help diverse communities and employers succeed. You'll see on our new website, what we've done is we've taken a needs-based approach to how we are um, presenting Comcor. Um, and in doing so, hopefully um, making the access easier, simpler, um, because uh, we're focused in on our end user and how they um, look towards us to help them um, and solve their problems. The three areas that Comcore invests and focuses in on is investing in the future workforce, uh, developing immediate pipeline workers, um, focusing in on the underemployed and unemployed, as well as training and upskilling the current workforce. And today we're really focusing in around, all around that first bucket, which is invent, investing in our future workforce. And we have a program called YouthWorks, um, Signal Success, and we have had uh, much success, but again, um, like everyone else, we are looking towards the future and we are looking to continue to innovate and change to adapt to the needs um, as they exist today. Next slide, please. Um, Commonwealth Corporation, I wanted to briefly talk to you about just the economic conditions and uh, in Massachusetts as they exist today, sharing some data points um, that kind of set up the conversation and the dialogue. So you'll notice that the unemployment rate for December um, dropped to about 3.9, continuing the downward trend, which is great. However, the labor force uh, workforce total number of employed is still below the pre-pandemic levels, but it is improving. One of the things that we are looking at is that there have been so many um, people that have left the workforce. And I was just talking to someone uh, on a call recently about you know, putting a, a solution in place and, and trying to get those workers back. And what I will say is honestly, we need to understand the question um, of why they left um, before we can uh, put together um, a solution that addresses that. I know the work for, uh, Executive Office of Labor and Development is doing exactly that to really understand why people are leaving and why they're not coming back. I know all of us have a lot of uh, theories. Um, we have um, a lot of firsthand experience, but I think that's an important question for us all as we think about workforce and we think about talent development and we think about our youth uh, in the future. Unemployment claims uh, insurance um, increased slightly um, in the month ending January 8th, 2022, and it was driven primarily by the construction uh, sector. And one of the things that has been very prominently uh, featured is that the pandemic, as we know, has exacerbated the inequalities in the workforce with Hispanic and Latino uh, unemployment at 10.1%. Blacks at 9.1% and whites uh, at 7%. So we have a lot of work to do. Next slide, please. You know, when we think about youth and we think about um, education and workforce development, this slide really speaks to the importance of, of the why and why we do the work we do and why it's so important. We know less than high school less than high school education. Massachusetts workers with less than a high school education or the family under 30,000 faced 12 to 19.7% higher unemployment rates than their counterpart. So it's important that we reach these youth and make sure that we are getting them either the education or the competencies and the training need so that they can um, beat these trends. Next slide, please. So preparing for the future and the future is now. Um, as I started by saying, we have been preparing, been preparing for this since last October um, with the strategic planning process um, that we have engaged in with uh, our staff, our board um, and uh, our partners. And we are focusing in on the following areas as an organization, diversity, equity and inclusion. 
Uh, we are focused on creating an inclusive environment where all employees feel respected and supported in order to thrive. Looking at the employee experience and investing resources to support staff learning and development, building capacity across cross-functional collaboration and implementing transparent, fair and equitable practices to increase a healthy workplace culture. Infrastructure and technology, automating systems and the goal is to free up human potential, enable creativity, innovation and improve access. One of the things that the pandemic and now with the, the vast amount of funds that are available, we need to really rethink um, our whole infrastructure. We have been very paper driven. That's not gonna work. Um, and we uh, are investing right now in, um, in, in our technology, um, in our processes, in our systems, making it easier for our staff, but also at the same time, making it easier for those um, who um, partner with us. And lastly, but most importantly, because this is what it's all about, the program focus, and really making sure we have an equity lens across all programs, investing in the future workforce, developing pipelines for workers with immediate hiring and training and upskilling the current workforce, all with an equity lens. One of the things around equity um, for Commonwealth Corporation in our strategic plan is it's embedded throughout the plan. It starts with our employees in terms of how we hire, who we hire, who's on our board, our board representation, but also we're looking at our program focus, ensuring that we have equity, not only in who we give our grants to, but who receives those grants on the other end, who's trained and who we partner with. Next slide, please. Future of work, uh, there was a recent study that was conducted and it continues to highlight the existing inequities. And without action, um, states that those inequities will continue. A um, well, couple of the key takeaways from this report is between 30 to 40,000 workers per year over the next decade will need to be upskilled or reskilled to respond to the growing needs of employers and the changes in workforce. Those are numbers we've never seen before. That, that equates to 300 to 400,000 workers that are going to need some type of training over the next 10 years. And we need to prepare for that. And we need to prepare our youth for that. There's a widening gap in wealth and access to opportunities among various ethnic and racial communities that could further concentrate and compound existing challenges and will be likely to disproportionately affect future workforce trends, such as automation and digitization. And last but not least, population groups negatively affected by the future of work trends are demographically skewed towards women, young people, and workers without college degrees and ethnic minorities. Again, we need to do better. Next slide. So Comcor, we recognize the importance of building youth pathway programs. Massachusetts is one of the few states with state funded programs targeting employment, ensuring young people gain the needed skills and experience to enter the workforce and obtain a path towards sustained success. In fact, for the past 20 years, income eligible teens and young adults from 31 communities in Massachusetts have participated in our youth works program. And a critical component of this program is our work readiness curriculum, Signal Success, which builds an essential body of skills and knowledge valued by our employees. Next slide, please. And this was another study uh, that came out from the Mass Commission of Unaccompanied Homeless Youth in 2021. Youth who experience housing insecurity face a multitude of complex challenges that perpetuate the cycle. This has only been made worse by COVID. So the opportunity for us as we think about our youth works program, as we think about how we deliver uh, our signal success and how we adapt to the changes um, now serving um, youth to the age of 25, we have an opportunity to re rethink how we outreach to non-traditional youths. If you think about the model as it has existed, it is supported 
basically traditional youth, those that have been involved in some kind of um, high school. We need to think beyond that. We need to think about how we outreach, what kind of infrastructure exists, what kind of partnerships we need to develop to ensure that we can create scale in outreaching to this population. Next slide, please. So achieving the greatest impact is gonna require us all to think differently. And the next slide, please. So if we look at the ARPA and the fiscal year 22 funding, we have historic levels of funding. YouthWorks in the past has, uh, we've had a budget of about 15 million. Next year, we have a budget of 25 million. Um, Workforce Competitiveness Trust Fund. Um, in the past, we've had a budget of about 2 million. The next four years, that budget is going to increase to $65 million. Now, this is money that we have never, ever seen. It's historic levels of funding. What it's going to require is for us all to think about how we work together to develop the scale, to develop the infrastructure, to be able to effectively reach and outreach to those that we need to serve. Next slide, please. So I wanted to take you through just uh, the Workforce Competitiveness Trust Fund. Um, there's three programs and these programs are um, been developed by the Workforce Workforce Skills Cabinet. Yeah, do that. And I was also thinking about and who are... Can we just mute everyone? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, workforce Skills Cabinet and uh, three programs. Um, the CTI program, which is a vocational geared program. Our Renew program, which is really about um, a partnership with employers and a payback upon uh, hiring um, employees. But the one I want to focus in on, because I think it has the most relevance to this group, is the Workforce Competitiveness Trust Fund. As I said, over the next three to four years, we will have $65 million in this fund. And the reason I think this fund is so relevant to this group is that it's, it is about training. Uh, at its focus, it is focused in on under and unemployed workers. However, the beauty of this, um, of this fund is that it's not just about training, it is about providing the wraparound services and support that is so needed for success. And I think this is a fund um, and this is an opportunity. Um, what we ask for is two or more uh, employer partners, um, agencies working with mass hire to develop bids. But what I've been talking to people about is creating um, consortiums, creating, creating collaborative uh, partnerships. Because again, this is all about scale and it's about us providing the resources that allows all of you to outreach um, the largest um, populations that we can in a meaningful way. Uh, and this, this is one fund um, that I think uh, has the opportunity to do that. Next slide, please. So back to YouthWorks and preparing for the future of YouthWorks. We hired a consultant last year um, to kind of help us think through how we scale up from 15 to 25 million and what that means. In addition to scaling up, it is how do we outreach and what does it look like? Uh, what is, should the program look like? And how do we create an infrastructure to support the increase of age uh, to 25? So what we've done is uh, we've developed the following strategies um, coming out of the work with our consultants and with our partners. First is, as we said, um, including the 20 to 20, 22 to 25 participants, which will be at the start of the summer of 2022 programming cycle. We are working with partners right now to kind of understand what that looks like to start building out pilots and really kind of think through how we most effectively um, outreach to that, uh, that demographic. We are gonna be offering planning grants between February 1st and Ju uh, June 30th, um, and re regions will receive additional funding as they think through what they need in terms of resources and support um, as we scale up this important program. Building in simplicity, simplicity and access is really, um, you know, two areas of focus for the organization overall. 
and looking at youth works, combining the summer RF, uh, RFR and the year round into one. Um, so we can look at a uh, strategic uh, opportunity for year round partnership um, and not just kind of chunking it out in terms of summer and year round. And what I will say that that also allows us to do is we have had, uh, as I think many have had, um, problems or opportunities recruiting youth. Um, we know that Amazon is paying, you know, 20 to $25 an hour, um, and we are not offering um, those types of rates. However, I think there's an opportunity to engage youth um, within the school year and bridge that gap over um, to uh, an annualized program. And that kind of gets, a, gets away from kind of that short term opportunity or um, competition against Amazon. And it provides the youth with a year round um, development opportunity, training opportunity. Um, and the other thing that we, are, we will be doing is engaging heavily with the private sector to build partnerships that span across um, the um, high school to 25 experience and provide a real pathway to a job at the other end. We have employer partners, but we have an opportunity here because uh, you know I, we have an opportunity to make it more than a partnership. We need to turn those partnerships into pathways for our youth. We are redefining the micro career pathway courses model, uh, creating guides and toolkits to support our partners in facilitating career readiness curriculum at the regional levels. And again, we are looking at also providing those wraparound services that I mentioned in the WCTF program here within the Youth Works model as well, um, with mental health partners to respond to the growing concerns and just the everyday needs um, of the participants in our programs. Next slide, please. So collaboration and innovation is the key as we move forward. Um, and I will add to that communication um, because it's, it's, it's important for us to understand the needs. It's important for us to understand barriers, barriers of access, um, because only in doing that can we resolve um, and provide programs that meet um, the needs of today. And as I've said, the first time in our, in our lifetime probably, the financial resource are available. That's not the issue. The issue is, how we face, the issues we face today are complex and they are gonna require us all working together, challenging the status quo, taking bold actions and thinking in ways that we haven't before. We will not solve these problems alone, but we will solve them together. And I thank you. Christine, thank you so much for laying the foundation for today's further discussion. Um, it seems like you've accomplished already so much during the I'm sure, very challenging the last two years. So thank you so much for sharing everything that you, you've done so far and all the exciting opportunities that are coming, um, coming up in the future. So um, if folks have questions for Christine, please send them in the chat and we'll be holding some time towards the end uh, for that. And now I would like to introduce our innovator, Connor Schoen, who's a co-founder and executive director of Break Time, uh, recently recognized as Forbes 30 under 30 for social impact. Connor is a young emerging leader in the nonprofit world with a deep infectious passion for empowering young people with opportunities and support they need to reach their full potential. Connor has a degree in applied mathematics and economics from Harvard University, and as such brings a unique data-informed quantitative approach to program design an evaluation to his work. Connor got his start in public service as Westboro's Project 351 ambassador in 2013. He served as chairman of the governor's statewide youth council. And most recently, he was a Chang Social Innovation uh, Fellow at Harvard Kennedy School. With that, I'm very excited to welcome Connor. Thank you so much, Tanya. And it's so great to see all of you. I see many familiar faces. Um, so thank you for being at this event today. Uh, we've been planning it for a while, and we really hope it provides an opportunity for folks to really see the work of youth workforce development from a few different angles. Um, so you just heard from the wonderful Christine Abrams, who I've had the pleasure of working with over the last year or so. Um, 
And that's really giving perspective into the work that the state government is doing to innovate when it comes to youth workforce development. Um, and today I'd like to share um, a bit about break time uh, for those of you who don't know us. And for those of you who do know us and those of you who are going to get to know us, I'd also like to share some updates on the work we're doing in the ways we're innovating to solve youth workforce development problems here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So I'm gonna share my screen. I have a quick presentation. Um, and after uh, I speak, I'll be uh, passing it off to my wonderful colleague, Michaela, and then later to one of our incredible partners, Michael. Um, so just to get us started here, let's see if this works. All right, thumbs up if you can actually see. Oh, we can see that. You can see it, Tanya? Yeah, just okay, great. wide show. Great, awesome. I never know what tab it's gonna pop up on, so I'm glad I run the right one. Um, so at break time, um, we really believe in creating opportunities for young people. And when I was younger, uh, here's a very embarrassing photo of me in eighth grade. Uh, I joined this organization called Project 351, which is a statewide group uniting eighth grade service ambassadors from all across the Commonwealth and Mass. Um, and that's really what, as Tanya mentioned, got me my start in service. Um, and when I got to college, I went on to work at the youth shelter Y to Y. Uh, y to Y is an incredibly innovative, groundbreaking nonprofit here in Cambridge. Um, they are a former SIF innovator as well. Um, and they work specifically with 18 to 24 year olds experiencing homelessness. Uh, in Christine's remarks, Christine mentioned that particular young people face huge barriers to obtaining employment stability and young adults experiencing homelessness are really at the top of that list. When I was working at Y2Y, -Y, I heard the same stories again and again about how young people in that shelter uh, would either face discrimination while trying to get a job because they didn't have a stable home address, um, they put their shelter address down and then they get denied almost immediately from employers. And even if they could get into a job, there was a litany of barriers preventing them from maintaining that job. Whether that's not having the same place to stay every night. So sometimes you don't have a phone charger, your phone runs out of battery, you don't have your alarm. Uh, you've got to leave the area. Many folks had to, to, to leave Boston just to find housing elsewhere because a friend in Texas said they had a place. So you couldn't even stay in the same place and maintain a job in the same place. Plus all of the challenges you're facing with the day-to-day -day stress of having to think about housing and where you're going to stay every night. Um, and with those barriers in mind, um, I really uh, adopt the belief that every single young person deserves the opportunities and support they need to reach their full potential. But that's just not the case here in the United States. 4.2 million young people experience some form of homelessness every single year in the US. And of those young people, 89% of them, 89% identify as uh, Black, Indigenous, or people of color. Furthermore, 40% of these young people identify as LGBTQ+. For me, as a pansexual young person working at Y2Y -Y at the time, I found so much incredible inspiration uh, and motivation from my LGBTQ plus peers experiencing homelessness uh, and really learned a lot from them as people who, despite everything going on in their lives, were so brave and authentic about who they were. That's really shaped who I am today and it's shaped how proud I am of my identity and it's shaped so much of my personal journey over the last four years. And so this is something that has really motivated the work I've done at break time because we see again and again, especially right now, how so many different issues disproportionately affect people of color, LGBTQ plus individuals. Uh, and the issue of young adult homelessness uh, is, is incredibly disproportionately affecting these communities, preventing young people from getting into the workforce and preventing young people from developing stability in their lives. So this is why break time exists in the first place, just to sort of position us within the broader ecosystem of the amazing organizations here in the Boston area. Um, there are lots of really uh, incredible organizations providing transitional housing, case management, and other services, some of which you see here. But back in 2018, when I was starting break time, what I would hear from these organizations 
is that many young people experiencing homelessness uh, after moving on from these opportunities or trying to get into the workforce just face barrier after barrier. And the problem we identified is what we at Break Time call the cycle of young adult homelessness. We see young people who don't have the job security they need to maintain housing and don't have the housing they need to maintain job security. You're stuck in this paradox where you really can't win. And what are you gonna to do to get out of that situation? And so that's why Break Time exists here in the first place. We wanna break the cycle of young adult homelessness. We wanna provide stable, we wanna get young people to where they have stable employment and permanent housing. And the way we do that is through our double impact initiative. Um, we believe that, uh, you know, we believe in a collaborative innovative model, just like Christine was talking about with Commonwealth Corporation. And the way our model works is that we recruit young adults experiencing homelessness from the, some of the other nonprofits I mentioned all across the area. Uh, we provide uh, a few weeks of professional development, personal empowerment, and financial literacy programming to really provide that foundation for each of our associates around how to succeed uh, in their job, how to succeed financially, how to create stability in their life. And then after that introductory training period, uh, each of our associates goes through a 13-week job placement at a local nonprofit or small business. And this is where that double impact piece comes in. So we have young people who, while building stability in their own lives, are out there in the community making a difference through their nonprofit and small business jobs. Um, so we'll hear later on from one of our small business partners, but I wanna emphasize here that we work with so many different nonprofits and small businesses in the community that need our young people's support and they're able to partner with us to provide a really life-changing opportunity to each of our associates. A newer aspect of our model is that we provide nine months of employment and financial stabilization services after you go through your job placement. Uh, and this comes with financial, monthly financial support, continued pathway coaching, check-ins, continued credit counseling. And another thing I wanna emphasize is throughout all of this time, we're matching any savings young people put aside because another challenge that young people face is the young adults I work with have no parental support and no financial safety net. So when it comes to saving up for first month's, last month's security deposit, or just like having any money in the bank account to float you through periods where you're not getting as much income as you'd like, there's nothing there. So we help young people to develop at least $1,300 in savings. We invest in them in that way. And we're also providing credit counseling to make sure they have the credit they need uh, to not only obtain housing, but maintain it. Uh, ultimately, success for us is really defined by three things. We want to see folks who are job secure, financially secure, and housing secure. Um, and all of uh, this slide and all the different pieces of our model is how we get there. And we're constantly innovating and, again, working with others collaboratively to get this all done. Um, so over the last 24 months, we've hired almost 100 young people. And I say hire because these young people are coming onto our payroll as regular W-2 employees. We're providing an intensive one-year experience. So we're really proud of the impact we've been able to have in those 100 lives. And they've had impacts on hundreds of thousands of their neighbors in need through the work that they've done. Just wanted to highlight some uh, quotes from some of our alumni. Erica here on the left said that, uh, break time is not just a job, it's an actual career propellant. And Amina said that they felt that break time is uh, uh, something that gives them a sense of life and joy. Um, Vicky here said that break time is a gateway into an endless world of possibilities and opportunities. And she emphasizes that her life has shifted and changed ever since she started her journey with break time. So just wanted to highlight some sort of recent changes and developments in our work. We've had some incredible uh, investment uh, recently uh, in scaling our work. We're aiming to bring our work statewide. So these recent investments have, have been catalytic in getting that process started. Uh, most recently, we were selected to be an innovator with the social venture partners. Um, we have had some major policy wins working with the state government to secure $25 million in ARPA funding for Commonwealth Corporation's Youth Works program, which Christine mentioned. Uh, we were able to include language in the uh, state budget that expanded 
uh, the age range of youth works to up to 25 and emphasized uh, the prioritization of young adults experiencing homelessness. And we were able to secure money in the city budget as well to support these year round opportunities, as Christine had mentioned, uh, to make sure that year round we're supporting youth employment. Um, and finally, our team has grown substantially. Uh, you know, again, we're a four year old organization, but we now have over 20 FTEs. And we're really proud of the community that we've created. Um, so, with that in mind, uh, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I want to pass it to the amazing Michaela Woodbury, who's our program ambassador of recruitment. I got to know Michaela in 2020 during the start of the pandemic. Michaela was one of our first associates at break time, and she came on to lead food production work we did for the city of Boston um, to, uh, to address the food crisis that was happening then. So she was in one of our job placements, having double impact in her community. And fast forward to today, she's leading recruitment at break time, and she's a primary example of what success looks like for us. So Michaela, without further ado, we'd love to pass it over to you. Thank you, Connor. So, hi, everyone. My name is Michaela Woodbury. Um, so, a little bit about me. Um, I'm currently the program ambassador of recruitment at Break Time. Um, I am 22 years old. Um, I graduated from Brookline High School um, and spent some time in college at Mount Ida College. Um, so, in 2020, I became homeless um, due to family issues um, and kind of had to find my way. And from there, I decided to go to a shelter called Bridge Over Trouble Waters, um, located in downtown Boston. Um, there, I was able to get introduced to break time, um, kind of letting them know I needed some sort of em employment um, just to help me get back on my feet so I could eventually obtain my own house or apartment. Um, so they introduced me to break time, um, and then I was able to start there. Um, and as Connor said, I helped with the food production um, kind of need at that time um, and making meals and packaging um, food for other families in Boston. Um, from there, I was able to obtain my serve state certification um, while I was in the program. And I decided to kind of venture off and find that um, I ended up becoming a cook at Boston Public Health Commission. Um, so I still continue kind of working um, with the homeless community. Um, and then I realized um, I really wanted to do more when it came to helping. So I became a case manager at uh, Boston Public Health Commission. Um, and there I really got into kind of how it works as far as employment um, and different resources in Boston for um, people experiencing homelessness. And at that same time, I was still homeless. Um, so it was great also because I was able to obtain those resources to help myself. Um, but overall break time through my whole journey has definitely been that kind of boost of confidence I needed, that um, help that I needed through their program, I was able to learn things like my credit and knowing what's good credit, what's bad credit, kind of how to fix my credit, um, knowing how to do my taxes. Um, that's stuff that I probably needed more help with and break time was that place to help me with that. Um, they also have a match savings program where every check that I obtained, I was able to save some of that and then they would match it and give that back to me at the end of the program. So that was a way for me to create um, more income for myself and sustain some stability, sorry, in my life. Um, I'm now going on a year in my own apartment, um, but break time was definitely able to help me. Um, they gave me a gift card to Target and was able to get stuff that I needed. Um, and that was very helpful. So break time uh, overall has definitely been a positive organization in my life that has been kind of turned that bad moments I had into a good moment. Um, and I'm definitely grateful for Connor um, and being able to be a part of it. It's definitely important, um, kind of the work that we're doing right now. I'm in the process of um, <clears throat> creating a youth leadership board. We're hoping to um, obtain other associates that were been in the program to be able to really discuss the policies and different things that are going on when it comes to homelessness that needs to be addressed. Um, so being able to have youth who have experienced it to be able to be that voice um, is great. And Break Time gives us that platform to have a voice, um, to be able to tell my story, to be able to 
inspire others. Um, it's great and I love it. Um, and I'm glad to now be full-time on the staff to be able to recruit other youth um, who are going through different things, different situations and being able to hopefully overcome it by the end of the program once they're finished. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Michaela, for sharing your story. Um, I'm always inspired by you and I get to see you multiple times a day. Um, so that really says something about the value that Michaela has brought to break time over the last two years. Um, she has seen us completely transform as an organization. Um, when she came on, it was just like me, Tony, and a couple other people. And now she's full-time on the staff and her team has grown tremendously. So Michaela and I have had uh, the privilege of getting to go through this experience together and I continue to learn so much from you every day. Um, now I would like to turn it over to Michael Aparicio, who's the uh, founder of RevB, uh, a small business consulting uh, firm. Michael is one of our site partners at Break Times. So he's one of the incredible small businesses that partners with us to create employment opportunities for young people experiencing homelessness. I've gotten to know Michael just recently but uh, his work in the community is tremendous and excited that he has the opportunity to be with us today. So Michael, uh, passing it over to you. Thanks a lot for the introduction, Connor. And uh, Michaela, thanks so much for sharing your amazing story. And just hearing that uh, just reinforces even more for, for me and for us at RevB, how much uh, uh, break time means uh, and, and the experience we've had and having a break time associate here for the past few months. So, so thanks for that. Um, we've gotten to know break time over the past few months, and uh, it was our first experience in having a break time associate here. And in first learning about break time, uh, kind of hearing the background, a bunch of what Connor has just shared, that really resonated with me. Um, I think the spirit of what we do at RevB and helping small business owners um, translated really well for me and just empowering people that are underrepresented with opportunity. Um, and if we could help uh, youth um, to also find uh, the, the opportunities and skills to apply maybe even their, in their own ventures or in employment, um, there seems to be a good connection there. Um, just a quick background of, of what we do. Um, so we are a small business consultant. We um, work with small businesses of a variety of industries from brick and mortar, retail, food, restaurants, uh, but also service businesses, hair salons, uh, other consulting businesses. And uh, so we're kind of a, very much kind of a business marketing technology kind of environment. Um, and, you know, I kind of thought about, you know, as we started in with the break time program, and I thought, you know, you know I think this kind of relates to what was said earlier about providing equity to the employment pools and opportunity there. And I'm not sure how, um, you know, the associate that we have, how he could have found us or how we could have found him, you know, if it wasn't for a program like Break Time. And also even just speaking candidly from a business owner's perspective, uh, there is a risk in offering a kind of a, an employment opportunity to someone maybe that's not, you know, on, at least on paper, you know, skilled, or maybe there's gonna be some more time involved. So, going through uh, being associated with the program where that support's built in and having a partner to lean on that, um, I think was really, um, it has really made the, the whole experience just even more, um, uh, more productive and just um, good outcomes there. Um, yeah, so I, Connor, I don't know if there's anything specific, um, any other questions you would love for me to address or just maybe sharing a bit more of maybe the type of work that, that was done or what would be best? Yeah, I guess quickly before we dive into Q&A, mm -hmm. Michael, if you could yeah. share a bit more about the work uh, that uh, the associate we paired with you is doing and sort mm -hmm. of, yeah, the scope, This I think it's always interesting to hear what kinds of jobs our associates are engaging in. Yeah, so the associate expressed interest in more technology related um, aspects of the work. So that was a good fit because um, as well as a growing business, we're developing our systems. Um, we are doing some of this work for our clients. So uh, internally, um, we had him jump right in in our evaluation of building a product. Uh, he had some experience in, in kind of working on app, um, looking at app architecture, and that was really interesting for him. So just an opportunity to put a real world case on that. 
Um, I, I think that really was engaging with him. Uh, learning tools like a CRM system, customer relationship management system, he's been really helpful uh, in uh, kind of just building more infrastructure there um, and even looking at our project management tools to help us be more efficient uh, and support in general over some of our client work. So research on uh, some of the digital marketing deliverables that uh, we conduct for our customers. Um, he has helped a great deal on that. And we are about to launch an entrepreneurship program. Um, and he was very creative in uh, creating a, a game uh, to in, include in the curriculum there. Uh, so it's engaging for, for the attendees. Amazing, thank you for sharing that. I just dropped this in the chat, but it's always mm -hmm. cool to, to hear about the breadth of things our associates are doing. Because mm -hmm. I think, you know, in 2020, we were really just focused on food service and what's cool about 2021 and now going to 2022 is we've diversified uh, significantly the industries we're engaged in. Um, so it's always so exciting to hear those types of things. Um, I'd love to open it up to Q&A, and I believe, uh, uh, Pavel, you'll be leading this portion of the conversation. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, Pavel Payano, Director of Community Mobilization here at SIF. We've had a really, really engaging discussions. Uh, thank you for all the presenters. Uh, we have a few minutes uh, before we have to end our programming, but I do want to make sure that we have at least uh, we're able to throw out at least one question that I'm going to ask uh, Connor and Christine to, you know, give us some, uh, some insights to. Um, and uh, the question is, how can the nonprofit sector, government and private sector be best work together to solve uh, the, the challenges uh, that you have all mentioned? Start, Connor. Um, you know, as we, I think Connor and I both said in our um, presentations, we have to work together. Uh, we can't do this alone. Um, you know, as I, as I said, uh, we have historic levels of funding, and we have, um, you know, we're putting in place programs that we think, um, and we are pretty confident, are going to meet the needs of today. But we can't do it alone. Um, all of you um, have needs. And it is up to all of us to figure out how we work together, how we build the partnerships, how we build collaboration across public and private sectors. Um, if we do that, and if we are successful, um, we will have the greatest impact. Uh, and that's really where we're at today is figuring out how we work together in a way um, that can really leverage these, uh, th this level of funding in a way that, um, positively impacts as many youth uh, and people as we can. I'm in total alignment with Christine there. Uh, one of our key values at Break Time is collaborative innovation. Uh, we really believe that we all have to be mindful of what each of us is doing. So we're one, not reinventing the wheel, and two, thinking about the most efficient and effective ways that we can work together. Um, and I think uh, in terms of the ways in which nonprofit and government can specifically work together, I always think of the nonprofit sector as sort of the space for innovation uh, of ideas that government can adopt for a long-term uh, establishment institution. Um, so similar to how in the for-profit world, VCs and startups are working to innovate new ideas that eventually go public and become large companies. I think that in the nonprofit sector, we as nonprofit leaders are developing the seeds of the ideas that can become huge government uh, institutions impact lives all across the country. If you look at Youth Build as an example, for those of you who know Youth Build, it's the national uh, federal program supporting youth workforce development. It was developed as a small nonprofit organization and the government adopted it into a full federal program uh, that is now all across the country and serving so many different young people. So as I think about how Christine and I work together and how break time and the state government work together in general, uh, we're always trying to find ways to take the insights that we're getting from our work with young people, take the things we're learning from the youth leadership board that Michaela is leading, and bring that in front of policymakers, elected officials, and administrative leaders who are able to translate that into large scale change across the Commonwealth. Um, what we can do as a small organization is only so limited in scope, 
But when we work with government, we can quickly and rapidly scale our solutions in ways that are unimaginable. So with Break Time Strategic Plan over the next three years, we aim to bring our work all across the Commonwealth. And to do that, our partnership with government is absolutely essential. And so we're really excited about the ways that we're working with, with Comcore on that. Uh, in terms of the private sector, you know, Michael's uh, work and what Michael had to share speaks for itself in the sense that the private sector is, is engaged and very important in uh, making sure that we can actually create opportunities uh, for our young people that are sustainable uh, and, will, and will launch careers for folks. Christine mentioned in her presentation around creating pipelines into private sector jobs. And Michael talked about the amazing work we're able to provide an associate in working uh, with, with RevB. So um, lots of collaboration to be done and really excited to have these folks to work with. Well, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, I think we've had, you know, as I said earlier today, we had some really, really great discussions. Uh, we want to be respectful of everybody's time. Uh, so I, I want to make sure that if you do have questions about break time or any of the issues that we've discussed, that you reach out uh, to Connor. Uh, we're going to be sure to, to put uh, his contact information on the chat. I want to thank our speakers today for joining us in such a rich and informative conversation about the importance of providing young adults uh, experiencing homelessness uh, with opportunities to build skills and confidence through stable employment. Uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us today. And if you're interested in uh, learning more about break time, uh, we encourage to uh, for you to reach out to Shamba and her team to schedule a call or virtual coffee. Uh, thanks again uh, to our track partner, Boston Open Impact, for uh, all of their support. Uh, and again, uh, thank you all for, for being here. I see a lot of familiar faces. Uh, we hope to see you soon and make sure that you stay uh, connected to SIF and our social media. So thank you and have a great rest of the day.